Julius Caesar, 100 to 44 BC, Roman general and statesman whose dictatorship was pivotal in Rome's transition from republic to empire, Caesar laid the foundations of the Roman imperial system. Interested? Do you want to learn more about Julius Caesar? Join me in this new episode from English Plus Podcast. And our topic for today is, who is Julius Caesar? Welcome to a new episode from English Plus Podcast, where you get to learn English, business, culture, literature, and a lot more. Two things to remember that you will always find extra practice on our website, englishpluspodcast.com. And don't forget to support us on Patreon to help us keep our content free forever. And now this is your host, Danny, and let's enjoy a new episode from English Plus Podcast. So welcome to today's episode. It's about Julius Caesar, the Caesar. All Caesars that came after the real Caesar, the original Caesar, were named after Julius Caesar. But who was this man? How did he come to take power? And by the time we finish talking about Julius Caesar, I'm sure you'll be kind of confused about this guy, whether to like him or not, whether to think he was a great man or not. But that is for you to decide. My job is to tell you about this man's life, because whether you like the man or you don't, this man played a pivotal role in a very crucial time and changed history as we know it. So without further ado, let's start talking about him and let's start talking about his early life. Born in Rome on July the 12th or 13th, 100 BC, Caesar belonged to a prestigious family that had been powerful in Roman politics for more than a century. During childhood, he lived through one of the most horrifying decades in the history of Rome. The city was assaulted and captured twice during the decade by Roman armies. The first takeover came from Caesar's uncle, Gaius Marius, leader of the Popularis, the Commoners' Party, along with Lucius Cornelius Cinna. The second attack came from their opponent, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, leader of the Optimatis, the aristocratic party. Each time the victors took power, they took revenge, murdering their opponents and seizing property. Cinna was murdered by his own troops in 84 BC. Caesar was allied with Marius, his uncle by marriage. Caesar's own marriage in 84 BC to Cornelia, the daughter of Marius' associate Cinna, further cemented the relationship. When Sulla was made dictator in 82 BC, he issued a list of enemies to be executed. Although Caesar was not harmed, he was ordered by Sulla to divorce Cornelia. Refusing that order, Caesar found it wise to leave Rome. He did not return to the city until 78 BC after Sulla's resignation. Caesar was then 22 years old. Unable to gain political office, he left Rome again and went to the island of Rhodes, where he studied rhetoric as the writer and orator Cicero had done before him. Caesar returned to Rome in 73 BC, a very persuasive speaker to begin his political career. The year before, while still absent, he had been elected to the pontificate, which was an important college of Roman priests. Now let's talk about his early political career. In Rome, the political dominance of the Optimatis was challenged during the 60s BC by Pompey the Great and Marcus Licinius Crassus. Pompey, a general who had earned his epithet, the Great, in army service under Sulla, returned to Rome in 71 BC, having defeated the rebellious popularis general Sertorius in Spain. At the same time, Crassus, who was a wealthy aristocrat, suppressed a slave revolt in Italy led by the gladiator Spartacus. Pompey and Crassus were jointly elected consul which was chief magistrate in 70 BC. Pompey was absent from 67 to 62 BC on military campaigns, first against pirates in the Mediterranean and then against Mithridates, a king in Asia Minor. Crassus, always Pompey's jealous rival, detected the brilliance of Caesar and fostered an alliance with him. Caesar was elected quaestor, which means magistrate, in 69 BC and appointed Aedile, official in charge of public works in 65 BC. 
he gained great popularity for the lavish gladiatorial games he sponsored. To pay for these, he borrowed money from the wealthy Crassus. As Aedile Caesar returned the war trophies Marius to their former place of honor in the capital, thus laying claim to leadership of the Popularis. In 63 BC, Caesar used Crassus's loan to win election as Pontifex Maximus, which means High Priest of the Roman religion. After Caesar's wife Cornelia died in 68 BC, he married a second time to Pompeia, the granddaughter of Sulla. He divorced Pompeia early in 61 BC because of accusations implicating her with a man who had broken into Caesar's house disguised as a woman during the festival of the Bonadea, which men were not allowed to attend. Caesar's wife, Caesar is reported to have said, must be above suspicion. Caesar then left Rome for a year to serve as governor of Spain. He married a third time to Calpurnia in 59 BC. And now it's time to talk about the Triumvirate, the famous Triumvirate. What was that? When Caesar returned to Rome from Spain in 60 BC, he joined forces with Crassus and Pompey in three-way alliance, later known as the First Triumvirate. His goal was to gain a major military command. To cement the relationship further, Caesar gave his daughter Julia to Pompey in marriage. Thus backed, Caesar was elected consul for 59 BC despite Optimati hostility, and the year after, 58 BC, he was appointed governor of three Roman provinces for five years. The provinces were Cisalpine Gaul, in Italy, north of the Apennine Mountains, Transalpine Gaul, which is known today as Provence, across the Alps in France, and Illyricum, along the coast of Yugoslavia. And that brings us to talk about the Gallic Wars a very famous and important stage in the life of Caesar. Caesar left home for Gaul in the spring of 58 BC and remained there until his invasion of Italy in 49 BC. He conducted military campaigns north of the Alps each summer, leaving his army there each winter while he came south to administer Cisalpine Gaul and Illyricum and learn what was happening in Rome. Each winter, he wrote up his account of the previous summer's campaigns. These superbly clear accounts, published as De Bello Gallico, the Gallic Wars, cover the years 58 to 52 BC. Caesar is our prime informant about his campaigns in Gaul. Now that he minimized or even concealed his own mistakes is certain, but these mistakes were infrequent. The events of 58 to 52 BC revealed to Caesar himself and to the Roman world that he was a soldier of genius. Moreover, he emerged from these years as immensely wealthy man as well as an extremely powerful man with a large army at his command. The country north of Transalpine Gaul was divided, as Caesar said, into three parts, inhabited by the Belgae, Aquitani, and Celts. The Idui, a Gallic tribe just north of the frontier, had become Roman allies and they appealed to Caesar for help against two invaders, the Helveti and the Subi. Caesar first defeated the Helvetii, a Celtic tribe, and forced them to return to their home area. Next, he crushed the Germanic Subi led by Ariovistus. Caesar then resolved to conquer the rest of Gaul. By 57 BC, he believed he had completed the task. However, early in 52 BC, while Caesar was still south of the Alps, the conquered peoples in Gaul, including the Idui, revolted. Caesar had taken advantage of the disunity among the Gauls. To resist Roman rule, they had come together under an intelligent general whose name was Vercingetorix. After suffering several setbacks, Caesar finally defeated Vercingetorix in what was the most spectacular of his military achievements. And now we come to the point where we have to talk about the power play. In 56 BC, Caesar won agreement from Pompey and Crassus that he would continue in Gaul for another five years. After Pompey and Crassus won election again as consuls in 55 BC. Following the election, Caesar went off to raid Britain and put down a revolt in Gaul. Crassus, ever eager for military glory, was given a command in Syria. Provoking a war with the Parthian Empire, Crassus was defeated and killed at Cary in 53 BC. This removed the last buffer between Caesar and Pompey. Their family ties had been broken by the death of Julia in 54 BC. In 52 BC, with Crassus out of the way, Pompey was made sole consul. 
Combined with his other powers, this gave him a formidable position. Jealous of his younger rival, he determined to break Caesar's power. To achieve this objective, he first needed to deprive Caesar of the forces he commanded in Gaul. Pompey ordered him to return to Rome without his troops. To protect himself, Caesar suggested that he and Pompey both lay down their commands simultaneously. But this proposal was rejected. Goaded by Pompey, the Senate called upon Caesar to resign his command and disband his army or else be considered a public enemy. The tribunes, or the officials who supported Caesar, vetoed this motion, but they were driven out of the Senate chamber. The Senate then entrusted Pompey with providing for the safety of the state. His forces far outnumbered Caesar's, but they were scattered throughout the provinces and his troops in Italy were not prepared for war. Early in 49 BC, Caesar and one of his legions crossed the Rubicon, a small stream separating Cisalpine Gaul from Italy. They moved swiftly southward to be met by additional forces. By bringing an army in Italy, Caesar was breaking the law. He quite possibly expected to persuade the Senate through Pompey to negotiate a settlement, but Pompey refused to meet Caesar. Pompey fled to Brundisium, which is now called Brindisi, and from there to Greece, and that started the civil war. The civil war that began after Caesar crossed the Rubicon lasted four years. Caesar provided an account of the first two years in his De Bello Civili, or the civil wars. In three months, Caesar was master of all Italy. His forces then took Spain and the key port of Massalia, which is now known as Marseille. Early in 48 BC, he landed in Greece to take on Pompey. In August, he smashed Pompey's forces at Pharsalus. Pompey escaped to Egypt, where he was assassinated upon his arrival. Caesar followed Pompey to Egypt, where he fought the forces of King Ptolemy XIII and triumphed. He then made Cleopatra, sister of Ptolemy and Caesar's mistress, queen of Egypt. In 47 BC, he moved into Asia Minor and defeated Pharnaces, who had taken control of the province of Pontus. Caesar later referred to this victory with the phrase Veni, Vidi, Vici, the famous phrase which means I came, I saw, I conquered. The last battle of the civil war took place in Spain against Pompey's sons in 45 BC. Caesar then returned to Rome. And now let's talk about the phase of his dictatorship and assassination. Caesar was appointed dictator for life in the winter of 45 BC. According to the constitution of the Roman Republic, the office of dictator was to be held only for six months and only during a dire emergency. That rule, however, had been broken before. Sulla had ruled as dictator for several years and Caesar now followed suit. In addition, he was made consul for 10 years in 45 BC. He also obtained a series of honors that were out of keeping with Roman tradition and a statue of Caesar was placed in one of the oldest temples in Rome. Caesar renamed the month Quintilis in the Roman calendar Julius, which means today July, we still use it until this very day, and obviously he named it after himself. Above all, he was in total command of the armies and this remained the backbone of his power. As a ruler, Caesar instituted various reforms. In the provinces, he eliminated a highly corrupt tax system, sponsored colonies of veterans, and extended Roman citizenship. At home, he negotiated a reasonable settlement of the large debts due to moneylenders, and he reconstituted the courts and increased the number of senators. His reform of the calendar gave Rome a less confusing means of recording time. A number of senatorial families, however, felt that Caesar threatened their position and his honors and powers made them fear that he would become a rex, which means a king. A title they hated as republicans, believers that a republic with an elected government is the best form of government. Accordingly, in 44 BC, an assassination plot was hatched by a group of senators, including Gaius Cassius and Marcus Junius Brutus. The respect felt for Brutus' integrity ensured the success of the plot. On March the 15th of 44 BC, when Caesar entered a meeting of the Senate, the conspirators killed him after a provocative funeral speech by Mark Antony, Caesar's body was burned in the Roman Forum. 
Because Caesar had no male heirs, he stipulated in his will that his grandnephew Octavius, whom he had adopted, become his successor. Octavius became Rome's first emperor under the name of Augustus. After all this, if we want to talk about Caesar's achievements, several difficulties stand in the way of a final judgment on Caesar. The first is that Cicero, who provides so much of our information on Caesar, hated him as the enemy of republican government. The second is that Augustus, Caesar's successor, found it prudent to draw a veil over Caesar's career as a dictator. For this reason, the poets who wrote during Augustus's reign hardly mention Caesar. Livy, who wrote the standard history of the Republic, was scolded in the friendliest way by Augustus for being a supporter of Pompey. Scholarly opinion of Caesar's accomplishments is divided. Some regard him as an unscrupulous tyrant with an insatiable lust for power and blame him for the demise of the Roman Republic. Others, admitting that he could be ruthless, insist that the Republic had already been destroyed. They maintain that to save the Roman world from chaos, a new type of government had to be created. In fact, Caesar's reforms did stabilize the Mediterranean world. Among ancient military commanders, he may be second in achievement only to Alexander the Great. And that concludes what we have to say about Julius Caesar. I hope you learned some new things about Julius Caesar, or if you don't know anything about Julius Caesar, so you were in for a treat, and I'm very happy that you stayed with me until this very moment in the podcast. Now, this is your host, Danny. I would like to thank you very much and to remind you again that you will find a lot more on our website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. So just take the link you can find in the description, go to our website and learn more. And remember, English Plus is not just about English. We have English, we have business, we have literature, culture, and a lot more coming your way. We will have poetry and fiction as well. And don't forget to help us keep all our content free. We don't want to make anything premium. I know that I said that earlier. I said that before that I wanted to make premium courses and stuff like that. But I don't want to do that anymore because the mission of English Plus is to provide quality education for people all around the world. Not because I know more than you do or I know better than you do. Not at all. But I just share things that I find interesting and I hope that you find them interesting as well. If you want to help English Plus achieve this mission and keep everything free, support us on Patreon. You will also find the link in the description of the episode. Go to the link, become a supporter of English Plus. We will definitely appreciate that. Now, with that being said, again, this is your host, Danny. I would like to thank you very much for listening to another episode from English Plus Podcast. I will see you next time.